Art Gallery of New South Wales isn't the obvious place to find an undercover cop. But for Mick Drury, it's a refuge. A place to stand still and be transported to a more peaceful world. Do you feel your heart rate come down a little when you take in artwork? Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's very, um, very settling of the soul and um, it's an escape for me from the bad world. It's an escape. Wonderful, wonderful works. I could take some of these home. <laughs> I wonder if Roger Rogerson's been to the art gallery. Oh, gosh, I, I couldn't answer that. <laughs> uh, you, you might expect he should because he plays the piano, doesn't he? He yes, he does. He does have a creative side. So. Yes, yes. Well, I think he's a very creative person. <laughs> the paths of Mick Drury and Roger Rogerson first crossed in the early 1980s because of this man, Victorian heroin dealer Alan Williams. Well, as a result of my investigation, Alan Williams was charged in Melbourne with some very serious heroin charges. Very serious indeed. And this was a significant heroin deal that you had uncovered. Half a million <clears throat> dollars worth of heroin or more. Um, my intentions were not to buy, but in actual fact to arrest them, which the Victorian police in due course did. When drug dealer Alan Williams was to face court, Mick Drury started receiving messages that Roger Rogerson wanted to see him. Turns out it was about the Melbourne heroin matter, a case in which Rogerson had no involvement. Instinctively, Mick Drury knew this was bad news. If Roger Rogerson wanted to see a young police officer like myself, you didn't ignore that request to go and speak to him. One way or another, you are going to have to speak to Roger Rogerson. Correct. It took a week for Mick Drury to make his way to Darlinghurst Police Station to see Rogerson. And when he did, he made sure Rogerson wasn't expecting him. And I walked straight in stood at the other side of the desk. He was sitting down doing his paperwork. And I said to him that he wanted to see me. What was it all about with the Melbourne case? And we started to talk. And he said? He said to me that he'd received word from the Melbourne case there was an opportunity there for me to receive fifteen to $25,000 if I altered my evidence. Um, I took a position on that straight away. And I said to him, I can't discuss it. I will have to go to Melbourne and give my evidence as it is and nothing can be done. And that's my attitude and I walked out. This is an extraordinary moment because you now know unequivocally Roger Rogerson is corrupt and he now knows that you know it was a big meeting. I knew what I was going to do in that meeting. I was not going to change my position. Otherwise, my entire career would have been a joke and I couldn't have lived with that. The whole thing would have been a joke. I would have let down my mother and father, my family, my friends, so many police who had invested great chunks of their career in nurturing me. Um, my, my entire career would have been a joke if I had have acquiesced to his intentions. It was a tough meeting, but I can assure you I was trained for those tough moments and I handled it. Why didn't <clears throat> you report Roger Rogerson? I could have done that and I'd thought about that. But I knew that if I reported Rogerson for attempting to bribe me, my career was finished and perhaps my life was in danger. 
The Williams case had already proved deadly to other witnesses. Drury's informant, Frank Avery, died from a heroin overdose. He was as likely to use heroin as what John Wayne would use heroin. In other words, he didn't use heroin. And co-conspirator Jack Richardson was shot dead in country Victoria. He was found dead 50 miles or so out of Melbourne um, with two bullet holes in the head. And I would suggest to you that was not suicide. And the next person up the tree was myself. I became edgy. I had a premonition. I had a premonition and a very strong feeling that my life was in serious danger. That premonition proved correct. On the 6th of June, 1984, Mick Drury was shot at home in front of his young family. Liz, the gun I was shot with was a 357 Magnum, which is very powerful um, and did a lot of damage. And I remember getting up and I could see the blood down the side of the wall. And I walked into the lounge room and I said to my wife, I think I've been shot. I think I've been shot. And then I told my wife to take both the girls and go into the bedroom, lock the door and stay there no matter what. But I couldn't stand up. I had to go into the lounge room. Um, and lay down because the pain was too great and I needed to relax on the ground. So I went into the lounge room and just waited. And my wife came out of the bedroom and she said she was going in next door to get the doctor that lived next door. And I didn't want her to, but I couldn't stop her. Because she was still fearful that the gunman could be out there? Correct. But she went. She did. You thought you could and would die? Mm. It was an amazing experience. You know, my life went before me. My only regret was, and you can understand this, that both my daughters, they were babies, and they were both crying. And all I wanted to do was go and kiss them. That's all I wanted to do, and just stop them from crying because Dad wasn't quite sure whether he would ever see his two little girls again. This has convinced his fellow officers he was shot by a hitman after getting too close to a narcotics boss in an investigation. Today, the Sydney blood bank was rushed with donors following an appeal for blood for the shot policeman. He received 13 litres in the operation after the attack. Mick Drury nearly died. He lay in a coma for 10 days. Police conducted house-to-house -house interviews in surrounding streets a massive police investigation seemed to make little headway. Police Commissioner Cess Abbott travelled to Sydney's Royal North Shore Hospital. When he awoke, Drury realised he had to drop a bombshell. How difficult was it to raise Roger Rogerson's name to investigators? It was tough, but I had to go in that direction. I had to be open and frank with them. And I remember when I mentioned his name, their faces almost became the same colour as the bed sheets. The blood just drained out of their face. They were in a state of shock because they knew what I'd just said. And the other issue is 
they knew that he was capable of being involved in what happened to me. It was an explosive allegation, one which would test Mick Drury to the limit and expose Roger Rogerson's powerful connections. The chief of the CIB, Angus MacDonald, a friend of Rogerson's, took over the case and made his feelings known when he visited Drury in hospital. MacDonald stood over me, he intimidated me, he threatened me. In your hospital bed? I mean, he directed me to get out of bed. You're sure you're not dealing drugs with a detective on no, the sir. north side? No. I'm not. Keeping people in line with baseball bats is what we've heard. You deny on that? Yes. It was a scene later played out in the television drama Blue Murder. Angus MacDonald standing over a fellow police officer, accusing him of being a drug lord, a pimp and a thug. So how did this make you feel? I just thought it was quite amazing. I wasn't concerned about it being truthful because it wasn't. But I should have expected this because of the level that I was playing at. I'm going to Newcastle. I'm sending an informant. He's going to tell me everything there is to know about you, fella. I'm going to Newcastle. And all I won't find out, you're bagging. He's up, Angus. Mick Drury stood his ground and Roger Rogerson would eventually be suspended and charged on allegations of bribery. I'm saying that the, I'm not guilty of the charge which is alleged in the summons. I'm utterly stunned uh, to receiving the summons and I certainly will be defending it to me. I've got no doubts at all that, that, I will be, that the charge will be dismissed against me. A jury did acquit Rogerson. For Mick Drury, it was a massive blow. But then he did something quite extraordinary. I walked out of court and I confronted him. But you shook his hand. Correct. That's quite something to do. My oath, and I wanted to because I wanted to engage him. I didn't want him to walk off. I wanted him to look at me square on and be fixed and talk to me so I could get a sense of was there more trouble that was going to happen down the track. And did you walk away thinking, I'm a little safer than I was before? I was a little at ease, but I knew there was more to come because only part of the story had been dealt with at that stage, the bribery, not the major issue of the conspiracy to murder. Coming up, a drug dealer's extraordinary confession. He pleaded guilty to conspiracy to murder. Me. The trail that leads straight to Rogerson. It was like a soldier taking money from the enemy to kill another officer. Who has one last card to play. People couldn't believe what happened. That's next on 60 Minutes.